thank you team khaki for having me uh, on this firm on this platform to talk about this most uh, uh, peculiar and enigmatic figures uh, which have been discovered in the recent past in the konkan you know uh, before joining uh, the directorate of archaeology i was posted in mizoram and when i joined in mumbai often i used to see these open jeeps of khaki and that led me to some curiosity uh, so i googled khaki and uh, i was quite uh, amused the way uh, you guys are running the show i hope uh, this pandemic situ- situation will be over soon and all we are uh, open to uh, open door people and who are stuck inside our houses so we are hoping to be in field soon so uh, thanks once again khaki for having me so let's uh, talk about our today's subject uh, that is petroglyphs from ratnagiri so uh, i was uh, introduced very generously uh, but still this is a, a very little recap of what i exactly do well uh, uh, as uh, as it was introduced earlier i did my phd uh, something related to harappan culture and uh, a book is also there in the published domain uh, then uh, we do conduct archaeological explorations and excavations and uh, as a child everybody is interested in firearms bandook kotho but that curiosity has led me to documentation of several uh muzzle loading guns which are lying on several forts across india <coughs> and i was part of uh, some documentation project which uh, luckily could see uh, published form and recently uh, we also dug up uh, some cave sites in konkan uh, which are again related to this uh, petroglyph figures and uh, curiously uh, uh, this is uh, my uh, this is my daughter's perception about me that baba is kind of tokka gola and baba is someone who chases uh, cannons and cannon balls and what not so that's the impression uh, i give to young people well coming back to my profession uh, it is quite amusing uh, to see people many a times joining archaeology with uh, this kind of thrilling expectations i wish my life uh, was this thrilling i wish i was indiana jones carrying sword and knife and uh, i was shooting around people chasing treasures and so on but unfortunately it is not as exciting as it is shown in hollywood movies uh archaeological research is a very slow very painstaking process exactly in the contrast of uh, hollywood lifestyle of archaeologist uh, i am no guy with uh, guns and knives yes i do use knife but that is only for archaeological excavation and many a times we are also confused with historians you may ask me again archaeology is one of the tools uh, for reconstruction of past human life so does history but in history mainly uh, basis for historical reconstruction is uh, a document a written word which we can interpret which we can use to create our story of ancient past and uh, in indian context uh, we will see that ashokan inscription is the earliest written document in india and prior to that everything is considered as prehistoric and this prehistoric uh, past of india uh, it consists of stone age then harappan civilization and several other chalcolithic sites of contemporary era but once you have inscriptions in seen there are so many things on which uh, documents are written for example copper plates bridge marks paper and so on <coughs> so for historical period we have plenty of evidence for reconstruction 
and for prehistory there is only uh, uh, man made objects and uh, uh, houses or structures which were created by human beings so in nutshell uh, main source uh, for archaeologists for reconstruction of human past is uh, these archaeological objects and features and structures excavated in archaeological context and we do use uh, historical documents to correlate our findings to have a bit better picture of the past and so does historians also utilize archaeological data to create a be better picture of the past so in nutshell we do conduct explorations uh, we look for new sites we conduct excavations at certain important places we carry out documentation uh, of excavated and explored material we take initiative for uh, preservation of archaeological sites and uh, we are the, the officially responsible people for conservation of protected property by government and up to an extent we carry out reconstruction and uh, we do management part also so uh, usually uh, this is our general mode of operation for explorations we study ancient literature geographical conditions we take into cognizance known monuments and sites we look into uh, known uh, inscriptions and uh, uh, coin hoards which are reported then we do study maps now aerial uh, photographs with drones and satellite imagery is also a new tool for archaeology but in spite of having data from all this one cannot skip going to field and that is uh, all romance of archaeology is all about uh, doing village to village survey talking to people getting information from people and thrill is to find a new site a new archaeological uh, mound they uh, somewhat look like this on your right uh, you have one unexcavated mound and on your left corner it looks somewhat like this after excavation so uh, this is what uh, we do and excavation is always conducted at certain important key locations where you are supposed to find certain answers certain query of historical past uh, for which uh, you are looking certain explanations and all these activities are not only carried out uh, on land uh, and from air but we also do uh, underwater operations and uh, archaeological explorations uh, near dwarka or uh, near uh, this princess royal ship uh, are quite famous in indian context but i i would say there is still scope of doing better underwater archaeology related uh, to tourism in india it is not as developed as uh, in mediterranean context and uh, why i am narrating all this in context of petroglyphs again uh, one has to understand uh, exact concept Uh, behind petroglyphs i mean uh, uh, petra is rock so it simply image carved on the rock or stone and you can carve this by um, removing uh, a surface part of uh, rock by incision by picking up by carving uh, from rock surface <clears throat> uh, the uh, example in the picture that is shown is from ladakh and they have just scooped out a uh, patina on surface of the stone i mean in stone uh, if it remains ex exposed to air uh, it gathers uh, a patina uh, in dark color and that patina is scooped out and again repatination may take hundreds of years so uh, this is one ideal way uh, to carve a petroglyph with minimum efforts in indian context such petroglyphs are seen in ladakh and if you look at uh, what context you have several examples of uh, petroglyphs reported from north american subcontinent from russia from african uh, continent and uh, from south america you have most famous examples of petroglyph art 
that is Nazca lines from Peru. So uh, these uh, these are quite humongous images uh, spreading over an area of say half a kilometer. So that's a giant spider and down below you have a monkey with a rounded tail. And uh, this is all dry land. Uh, there's a lot of uh, weathering of the surface rock. And what they have done, they have just removed uh, surficial weathered rock uh, with some basic instruments. But beauty is that you cannot appreciate this image from ground. You have to go up in the air, and you know in Peru, the craft flights are quite common uh, to view these images uh, from air. Coming back to uh, uh, our uh, Ratnagiri or Konkan context, for the first time. Petroglyphs were reported in 1990s from a place called Neuri Fata uh, near Ratnagiri. Uh, and unfortunately, at that point of time, uh, it was not paid uh, proper attention, uh, and people could not understand what it was. I mean, uh, just have a look at this picture and try to understand, try to figure out what it looks like. It looks like uh, a square or a rectangle. Then again, there are some geometrical subdivisions, but you can't really uh, make out uh, meaning out of this image. So it was vague, it was confusing. A few other uh, uh, nearby sites uh, near Neuri, uh, besides Neuri Fata, there's a place called Neuri Gaurewadi, where you have uh, these images in form of circles or in form of two human legs. I have to give credit uh, to a series of people who worked uh, to discover these petroglyphs, starting from uh, a scholar known as uh, Dr. Daud Darvi, who worked for Konkan Itihas Parishad, was the first one to notice these curious images in context of Konkan. So unfortunately, Dr. Darvi is no more. His work is carried forward by two of his colleagues uh, from Konkan Itihas Parishad, uh, Sadashiv Tetwilkar and Ravindra Lard. And then you have uh, Dr. Anita Rani Kothari from Xavier's College in Mumbai, who discovered few petroglyph sites, again from Ratnagiri. And then you have uh, a gentleman uh, in specs in the middle, uh, Mr. Satish Larit. Uh, who is a uh, government official uh, and who got interested and who discovered few sites from Sikudur. Then uh, there's a known uh, Marathi writer, Prake uh, Ghanekar, who happened to visit few of the sites and he was the first one to mention uh, petroglyphs in context of tourism. Uh, he came up with a book uh, called Kokanatil Paryatan, and this is for the first time he mentions uh, a Marathi term called Katra Shilpa, which is quite popular now. Uh, then there's a team from Deccan College, uh, Dr. Uh, Gokte, Shrikant Pradhan, and Prabhu Chiragar, who were in the process of discovering uh, archaeological sites from the coastal region and who uh, stumbled upon few petroglyph sites they documented. And this team is the first team uh, to publish a technical ar uh, article in archaeological journal. Then uh, a very important role is played by a local organization, which is basically engaged uh, into uh, natural uh, 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 trail activities called Nisargayatri from Ratnagiri. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, Mr. Rizbud. Uh, Dhananjay Marathe and Surinder Thakur Desai from Ratnagiri, who happened to discover many of these images. And they were the one uh, who brought these images to attention of the archaeology department again in 2017. So we shifted one of our young boys from Pune, Rutvi Japte, to Ratnagiri. And we again revisited all the sites uh, reported by the scholars uh, discovered by Nisajayatri. And we also put up a team together in order to find new sites along with Nisajayatri uh, Samstha Ratnagiri. 
so again going back to indian context uh, in stone age itself uh, you can see this human urge uh, to reproduce uh, figures of animal through uh, pictures and evidence comes from a world heritage site located in central india so you have uh, the site of bimbetka which is quite famous which is quite close to uh, stupas of sanchi Uh, where uh, you can find about 600 odd caves and many of them uh, they have these painted images of animals so uh, there's a overlapping phase uh, of over stone age uh, of historical paintings but still uh, you can see some examples uh, a figure of a bull is carved then you can see humans hunting hunting this bull and uh, many species of deer are uh, very well represented if you look at uh, dispersal of such uh, sites with paintings you get to see many rock shelters in mirzapur area uh, that is eastern up bundelkhand even parts of vidarbha this culture is quite widespread so in archaeological terminology we call this phase as a mesolithic phase which is like after stone age and before historical period that there is a bridging gap which is always represented by neolithic or mesolithic phase so this phase is classically known as mesolithic phase uh, but curiously you don't have too many rock carvings from this area rock carving only comes from uh, ladakh or kerala uh, or uh, karnataka these are again few representation of uh, uh, some of the uh, chalcolithic sites i mean after stone age people started practicing agriculture and they started using copper so that chalco uh, is copper and lithic is stone so uh, the uh, phase when humans were using copper that phase is called as chalcolithic but that is also remarkable for uh, use of agriculture for living now humans are no more dependent on hunting and gathering uh, from jungle so they also started uh, doing agriculture and uh, we have picked up few figures of animal which were carved uh, which were painted on pots of chalcolithic period and this evidence is again from maharashtra and site is in amgaon again from same site you have evidences of uh, a female figure which is essentially headless and uh, excavator feels that this is a mother goddess figure again you might think that why i'm showing all this but uh, there is a contact to all this at the end again let me uh, take you to this beautiful caves located in aurangabad district of maharashtra known as pitalkhara and pitalkhara has the earliest evidence of art from maharashtra so you can see this beautiful figure uh, of a monk uh, with tied up bun at hair and uh, there is a proper chaitagraha and unfortunately and unfortunately a damaged vihara is revered from uh, pital khara dating back to 3rd century bc and this art uh, further took uh, a very developed form uh, from satvahana paintings of uh, limited colors shown on the left to uh, amazing uh, amazing uh, painted art of maturity of classical age uh, of vakataka region and all evidence again comes from aurangabad district of maharashtra and of course architecture stone carving also flourished to a great extent in the later ages but how all this began i mean what is the earliest date when actually humans started uh, carving stone and so far before we started our research on petroglyphs in uh, konkan the answer was always pital khara 
I mean, before third century BC, there were not too many evidences of uh, rock carving, rock, rock carved sculptures from Maharashtra. So one was always pointing uh, towards this uh, caves in context of Buddhism around early uh, era of Christian, uh, early centuries of Christian era. So the beginning was always taken around third century BC. Let's go back to Konkan. Uh, it's a very thin area sandwiched between Sahyadri Mountains and Arabian Sea. So there is not much of a space. Uh, there are mountain slopes of uh, uh, basaltic origin. Uh, then <coughs> you have uh, wonderful beaches uh, towards the seaside. And in between, there is a sandwich area of lateritic plateau. In Marathi, they are often known as Sadaj. Uh, and uh, they are, uh, from a perspective of government, uh, they are considered to be barren lands where nothing grows, non-productive, and so on. And from perspective of tourism also, this particular patch is only a transit area. I mean, if you are going to, if you are pl planning a trip to Konkan, you will invariably go to beaches, and very few people, they venture to hillside. So, we... Uh, essentially started our survey in Ratnagiri district because uh, uh, that was the place uh, from which most of the known petroglyphs were reported. And before we started, uh, the uh, data was known only from about 14 to 15 uh, villages. Uh, we redocumented that and we started uh, visiting uh, new villages also. So, we in that process so far we have explored about 48 villages from uh, Ratnagiri, Rajapur, and Lanja Taluk of Ratnagiri district. And now we'll be shifting our operations in Sindhudurga district. And uh, again, in next couple of years or next five years, uh, we are planning to document entire. Uh, we are planning to scan entire Sindhudurga district in order to document this petroglyphs. So uh, this is the location of settlements uh, from Ratnagiri district. So you can see mostly uh, they are oriented uh, in coast or wherever there is more spread of this lateritic plateaus uh, towards uh, hillside or towards Sanyadris or Ghats. Uh, the petroglyphs are also found from that area. Uh, I'm not sure uh, whether petroglyphs are also found in Raikar district. Uh, we need to look into this fact again. Uh, let me start uh, with the most exciting image reported from uh, Dehud. And uh, this is image of a single horned rhino. And this is quite huge almost six by four meters in size. Let's have an uh, aerial view. I think in aerial view, you will be able to appreciate its single horn, then two raised ears, and uh, pretty virtuous and circular body form and a very pointed and raised tail. And again, you can see two legs. Of course, this is four-legged animal, but this is a typical characteristics of uh, uh, Konkan petroglyphs that animal is always shown with two legs and two legs, other two legs always remain hidden behind uh, these two legs. So depiction of animal is always sectional and uh, head is slightly tilted because if it was uh, uh, in perfectly straight perspective, it is not possible to see two ears, uh, two ears of any animal. But invariably, uh, while depicting each animal, you get to see two ears. Down below, uh, in in left corner, you see a long uh, line, a very thick line, and that is probably a depiction of python, 
uh, please remember some of them are uh, put in scale and some of them are not so above which you have depiction of two animals one is probably hyena and other is monkey and again towards your right you have a depiction of a deer uh, so uh, uh, this is again carved uh, with single line on uh, laterite rock now we go to uh, another interesting site uh, called save where you have uh, three human figures depicted uh, along with uh, 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 along with wild boar let us uh, have a look at uh, drawing so you have a clear understanding down below you have a standing human figure and uh, on either side uh, you have depiction of boars and in middle you have a standing human figure with a flower and again uh, to his right you have a depiction of boar and a very curious figure is depicted on top that is seen in your picture and that is of a woman while giving birth you can uh, see swelling uh, uh, in in uh, stomach area then you can see widespread two legs initially it was difficult for us to interpret this image then one of known gyne gynecologists from bombay visited uh, this particular site and she said this is a position of a woman while giving birth so we found this image quite curious and uh, then we made some clear uh, very close observations and then we saw that this is deliberately carved uh, here so there is no attempt to show head now please try to recall a image from inamga that was also a mother goddess uh, shown with prominent breast and uh, uh, thighs but you know it was again headless image now we go to site of kapadga pretty interesting depictions uh, down below you see a fish uh, are you able to see my cursor so this is a large depiction of a fish uh, carved with uh, a little deep relief and above that you have a human figure with extremely stylized feet they almost become circular above which you have a depiction of a sea turtle and again uh, you have carving of some different animals on the same side so now we go to most interesting part uh, of uh, ratnagiri petroglyphs and evidence comes from a village called kashari uh, and this village is approachable while going to ganpatipure from ratnagiri and here you see a huge depiction of an elephant and again i will move cursor these are two ears then this is a very small neck portion and then this is back uh, of elephant and this is tail portion these are two legs and this is elongated trunk very well defined outline of a huge elephant but what is more interesting that you have depiction of n number of animals along with elephant inside this figure even outside you have a depiction of few animals around and if you uh, go to uh, little more details uh, elephant seems to be the most dominant choice for depiction you have elephant here again here and uh, again outside you see uh, uh, two species of cat family uh, probably uh, leopards Uh, then again uh, you have many terrestrial animals like wild boar and monkeys but again most interesting part of this figure is depiction of a, a rhino probably this is a baby rhino depicted here and again uh, beside terrestrial animals you have depiction of n number of uh, animals from water 
that is essentially a fish and one can even identify species that this is a shark uh, which is not really found in shallow waters very close to the coast this is another depiction of shark and very interestingly there are a few depictions of stingrays and among uh, birds most identifiable and prominent depiction is of a peacock so you have entire animal kingdom including birds uh, including uh, terrestrial animals and including amphibian uh, animals covered inside this figurine but uh, most astonishing part of this figure is its size and i think size does matter you cannot appreciate this size while standing on the ground uh, you cannot see uh, this full elephant you uh, see isolated uh, figures and uh, if we give numbers to this this is about 16 meters wide and 13 meters tall so a pretty huge figure and this is only appreciable with a drone i mean uh, in future definitely we would like to have uh, some development which will facilitate uh, tourists going to that site and we don't want tourists to see again uh, pictures from drone a uh, drone when they are actually standing on the site so i will not be surprised if uh, i see a uh, a hot air balloon with a level khaki floating on above this side showing all this wonderful uh, petroglyphs uh, from the air we really need to come up with uh, this innovative ideas because uh, uh, when we had some dialogue with uh, officials from uh, other government departments or even ngo uh, which is working uh, in this field that is nisargayatri they had ideas of building towers uh, near this petroglyphs so people can actually climb and appreciate this but you know uh, the whole landscape is actually littered with small small figures and we also found a lot of stone tools from surface of the site which have given us some idea about its dating so doing some kind of construction some kind of physical intervention is really a very strong intervention in the landscape and uh, that is simply not advisable but hot air balloon a uh, small uh, micro light aircraft a glider certainly all these are welcome ideas now let us uh, move to another interesting site called rundhetai and i am showing uh, this particular depiction uh, Uh, for the reason again you will see uh, fish uh, jellyfish and uh, an animal from cat family uh, is carved here but you will see all they are carved with single lines and <coughs> carving such single lines with stone is not really a big deal but if you look at abstract figure carved just beside it that is uh, done with some deep diggings this is like 8 uh, to 9 cm deep uh, in depth and this is about uh, 9 to 10 inches and sometimes uh, it is above uh, 12 inches so there is a uh, considerable amount of depth uh, is taken while taking uh, while making carving this uh, figure in relief again uh, if you try to understand uh, this is a circle and in between circle you have a rectangle and there is a stylized depiction of human figure again with open arms and open legs but there is a head here uh, we are not sure this is just a projection of neck or head and beautiful symmetry put by these crosses on these circles on four corners of this uh, circular rectangle another interesting evidence uh, is from uh, devi hasor and this is uh, actually a, a, a chitta patta kind of thing 
uh, which is carved on the ground. This is in vicinity of a temple, which is still under worship. And uh, today it is also connected to religious practices of the, the people who are residing uh, near this temple. Uh, a palki of goddess is brought up and it is kept in the center for some time uh, before the festivity starts. So these figures are still connected with religious practices uh, of people in Konkan. But uh, of course, they are not able to interpret uh, what this is about. This is view of the same petroglyph from the air. So this is not a perfect uh, square, but you can see uh, there's, uh, there are four divisions, four sub-squares, and again, some beautiful uh, geometric patterns and uh, the spiral pa patterns, uh, which is called as uh, serpentine by the locals. And there are many stories associated uh, with snake. So definitely uh, this is uh, related to snake worship or nature worship in uh, physical form. Now we go to a place called Basuta Sada. And again, uh, this depiction is very interesting. Uh, there's a, a standing human figure uh, and you can see tigers on the either side. And immediately you may recall uh, some of the uh, seals in Harpan, in context of Harpan civilization, uh, that many of such seals, uh, they carry this particular motif. Uh, that uh, you have two animals on either side and in between there's a standing human figure. And you may also recall to a very famous legend of Gilgamesh uh, from Central Asia who fought with animals with his bare hands. And uh, of course he was a king but he uh, was also given a divine status. So we don't know whether this particular figure is related to Harpan civilization and how this motif has traveled. Recently, uh, this, uh, this has come to the light of archaeological community and we need to do more research to arrive at some conclusion. This is what I was talking about. The famous uh, seals from Harpa and Mohenjo-daro. So you see the standing figure and uh, literally holding throat of this wild beast. And I think this is what uh, the gentleman from uh, Basu is doing. He's holding against uh, two tigers on either side. So these seals are dated back to about uh, 2800 BC or 3000 BC. So the image uh, from Basu is definitely more than 5,000 years old. Now, uh, these are some minor depiction. Uh, uh, besides abstract figures and animals, you get to see uh, representation of humans also at many places. And of course, they're depicted in very stylized manner. So that also gives uh, rise to theories like aliens and whether this is depiction of helmets and so on. But trust me, nothing of that sort. This is a site of Colombe where you find a stylized depiction of human being, a stylized depiction of jellyfish, deer, and uh, one can uh, easily identify that this is a male species with horn and prominent depiction of uh, genitals. So it's a combination of human and uh, animal figures at site of Colombe. And you have a site of Zano with multiple depictions of human figures. And there's a very curious uh, depiction of octopus and stingray. And of course, there's a deer. So this is a deer from Tsave. Then you have a monkey uh, uh, carved at uh, Gova. This one, uh, one more interesting figure from site of uh, Sakha Kombe. 
at, uh, this is definitely a figure of a bird uh, and you have open wings and uh, you can easily uh, understand its scale it's it's quite large in size and so far it is interpreted as uh, eagle but we are not sure still we are open for more interpretations now there is another uh, figure of a bird uh, which technically looks like elephant bird but elephant bird never existed in india so uh, a closer interpretation as uh, this is probably uh, mardok uh, bird often found in plateau regions of maharashtra but of course beak is quite different but rest of the features of body they match and these horizontal lines with yellow grass uh, are of jcb so they are practically trying to uh, dig uh, inside this now it is quite common uh, on this uh, uh, on this laterite plateaus to dig small holes and put some soils for mango plantation and this was about to be destroyed but luckily uh, we could stop those excavations again uh, fish from the site of umre is another stylized depiction of stingray from kashari uh, this is a close view of sea turtle uh, from kapadgaon this is a close view of uh, uh, alligator these are three different methods in which human figures are carved Uh, one can see human figure carved with simple outlines then uh, there is another type where middle part is left in open relief and uh, nearby area is scoped out uh, so that the uh, figure in the middle uh, comes out uh, from its plane on the ground and there is a third type that you also uh, you not only dig uh, area around but you also try to carve uh, some uh, features in the interior but if you look closely it exactly it will present to a of a standing man if you look at this figure on the left so generally we have labeled them as x ray type of uh, figures and uh, there is again a very peculiar pheno phenomenon which we can again exploit from the point of uh, view of tourism there is a place called devate gothne and it has got amazing phenomenon of magnetic deflection so uh, please pay attention at two compasses uh, at top they are showing exactly opposite direction Uh, look at compass uh, in mobile phone it is all together showing some different direction so uh, this is what we noticed in a single figure carved near plateau of uh, devate gothne that uh, this has got uh, a strong feature of magnetic deflection and uh, this deflection become uh, its strongest near this petroglyphs and as you move away from this as you go uh, around 100 feet uh this deflection is almost nullified and as you start moving close to it your compasses they start behaving crazily and uh, i exactly don't know scientific explanation for this uh there is a institute uh, by central Ge government of uh, geomagnetic studies we have approached them and hopefully after this pandemic is over the team will visit and investigate this phenomena and they will try to come up with some scientific answers uh, some other figures now they are from uh, sindhudurg district and they are not uh, really documented in scientific manner so far so after we document them uh, i'll prefer to include them in my upcoming presentations so if you want to classify this whole data uh, you have uh, essentially faunal depiction as a first and foremost category and among animals you have elephants rhino deers then pig cattle rabbit buffalo uh, then among uh, uh, this uh, the carnivorous animals you have tiger 
uh, etc then uh, among birds peacock is most prominent then among aquatic animals you have sharks stingrays and many other unidentified species and you have amphibious animals like uh, tortoises and alligators and besides this you have uh, many human figurines and uh, uh, there is a major category of abstract images uh, or the geometric patterns and there are many sites uh, where you only have geometric patterns along with two legs of humans so uh, these two legs are again identified uh, as uh, fertility practices of mother goddess so i'll skip all this boring statistics uh, which will be irrelevant in with addition of more and more data but most interestingly how old are these and to answer this query again we applied archaeological parameters and as i mentioned from site of kashari where that large elephant site is found and uh, the site of save we could pick up this small microliths which are very important from archaeological context earlier i spoke about uh, a phase uh, which represents transition from stone age to historical period called mesolithic so these particular small stone tools they are essential indicator of this mesolithic phase and uh, of course open to a uh, uh, find of any tool does not carry any meaning they are out of context so we are actually looking for spaces where humans might have stayed and they have carved this petroglyphs on open rocks uh, on horizontal ground but it is not possible they were actually staying uh, on those rocks Uh, th at that point of time, uh, I mean, science of uh, constructing houses was not so advanced. So they were taking shelter in uh, these kind of caves. So we focused our attention uh, on such cave sites. And for past two years, we are doing uh, this excavation in place called uh, Kashari. Uh, sorry, Koroshi in Sindhudurga district of. Uh, uh sindhudurg district and uh, again you will see that from excavations itself uh, we have found similar stone tools which are dated back to mesolithic uh, period and throughout india this mesolithic period is dated from uh, say uh, 40000 bc to uh, 5000 bc and uh, this dating varies at different different places and in lower most level we could find uh, tools which are little bigger in size so that is a good indication of uh, late existence of low late stone age so there were people who were staying around 50000 years bc in konkan and uh, this uh, petroglyph carving culture uh, is a byproduct of uh, the same uh, group of people which got converted from stone age to mesolithic period uh, and then to historical period so there is a great continuity uh, in time frame uh, of this uh, petroglyphs and uh, you will appreciate uh, this uh, arrowhead now you may ask me Uh, whether how you can use this this is kept on my fingers of my hand and you will be able to see the notch they have created for hafting a shaft uh, which is very essential part of any arrow and uh, on obverse side uh, they have carved it in a such fashion that you have a prominent ridge in the middle so scientifically speaking if you pull string of a bow you put entire force on shaft of an arrow and this pressure is ultimately shifted in the middle part of this ridge and ultimately uh, maximum pressure is created on this point and that is how point penetrates with maximum force into skin of in any animal uh, well 
forget about hunting big animals but definitely uh, you can hunt small games uh, with these kind of arrows and if you look at the paleo diet of stone age man such small games uh, in form of uh, hares or uh, these all medium size animals they form a large part of diet by a stone age man and this is how uh, the cave uh, would have looked like when people were actually uh, staying uh, here and uh, this is what we are ultimately planning to do our excavation is over now it will take couple of years for us to process with scientific analysis and to come up with a report on this but meanwhile we are also drawing a plan of uh, tourism development of this particular cave where we can recreate uh, these dinomas uh, dinomas and we can actually have uh, sculptures of stone age animals uh, stone age humans uh, in in same fashion the way they used to live and there could be uh, a small uh, information board a small uh, interpretation center in the village uh, where you leave your vehicles and you take a beautiful hike of about 2 to 3 kilometers up in the hill and then you approach uh, this cave so this is really uh, a great opportunity of some orbit uh, tourism well uh, so uh, only discovery is not important but uh, conservation of uh, such petroglyph sites is again a very important aspect uh, of uh, uh, present day and uh, this is the site of okshi where uh, this kind of uh, boundary is created by nisarga yatri in coordination with the directorate of archaeology there is also a small watchtower and it houses this beautiful figure of elephant and again you can say it's a male uh, figure and this is what we are planning to do with rest of the petroglyphs and uh, you know this this was the first time i realized its uh, potential from economic perspective that we are also going to place uh, signages uh, 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 district administration and uh, zp was kind enough to create a road from village uh, to this petroglyph and we are going to uh, place signages on each turn on one turn uh, i happened to meet a chai wala and he said uh, sir itha lau naka don't put don't put any signages here i said why he said just to ask direction people stop and then they have a cup of tea with me and earlier i used to earn say 5 to 700 rupees a month and my stall was inside village now i, I am outside village but i earn 10 times more only by working on weekends and it it really zapped me i mean this is the kind of economic change uh, that this petroglyphs have so it's not only historical or archaeological importance and it is also going to bring a great economic change for people who are actually residing on this sadas or uh, this barren plateaus and uh, we uh, as a tourist we always treat uh, these plateaus as transit points like we go from hills to beaches but we never stop uh, in this lateritic patches now we have a good reason to stop by so this is how uh, it looks like when it is fully done so at least now it is uh, protected from uh, walking animals or jcbs or tractors and so on similar attempt is uh, done at dehud uh, uh, again by uh, uh, sergey atri uh, uh, a local organization in ratnagiri and they are working in close coordination with our department so uh, we are uh, being a guiding factor uh, we generally scrutinize the proposed uh, proposals and we give them technical advice and the money for the conservation of this uh, comes from people 
so this is a great initiative uh, and this is a, a best example how government departments can closely work with the local communities and all these petroglyphs are found in private uh, privately owned lands so the owners were generous enough to allow us to do all these construction activities in order to protect them and uh, we are uh, looking forward uh, to work with this organization in order to protect more and more petroglyphs from konkan region again coming back to interpretation part of uh, abstract figures uh, this is wali paintings and all of we we know that walis are mostly found in north konkan area but again uh, this is a figure from sakha kombe and you will see two legs and again similar hands and a head and it quite resembles to one of the Uh, fertility goddesses which are depicted which is depicted in wali paintings only on the occasion of marriage in marathi uh, this is called as tanda and the goddess is known as palghat so this is essentially a depiction of uh, palghat but again in south konkan now you don't have uh, any uh, any wali people uh, dwelling the uh, 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 tribal dwellers of that area uh, are not known for the artistic acti- artistic activities like wali so again we need to see whether walis uh, have shifted from south konkan to north konkan and we need to understand uh, wali paintings in a better fashion so that we can uh, interpret all the abstract figures uh, carved in this petroglyphs to uh, further our interpretations we also invited some of the uh, international scholars and uh, this is uh, professor edwin neumeier from austria who was practically astonished by uh, seeing all these petroglyphs and he said i need to revise my thinking about indian rock art and unless uh, a special chapter is added from konkan petroglyphs uh the work on uh, indian uh, rock art uh, will not be complete so he mostly uh, confirmed our interpretation about uh, this some of the sites being uh, as old as uh, 30000 years old and again he confirmed that there is a continuation over the long period which continues almost up to historical era and uh, as you move little further uh, you have similar petroglyphs reported from goa there is a site of fansaima and uzgaima which are state protected monuments uh, by goa state archaeology further uh, there is a new evidence from udupi region of karnataka where uh, petroglyphs are reported but this information is again taken from social media we are still waiting uh, for some uh, scientific arche- archaeological exploration and investigations of karnataka region kerala was already known for its petroglyph depictions of course uh, quite uh, different in style and it might have had its own uh, genesis uh, but <coughs> goa uh, and konkan petroglyphs uh, they more or uh, less uh, share similar styles so as an archaeologist what we are trying to do is we are trying to bridge the regional gap between stone age and historical period so there was a sort of dark phase uh, uh, of konkan uh, during which nothing was known about human existence so we are basically connecting this link and as a professional archaeologist that is what we do we try to bridge these gaps uh, between chron- uh, human chronology we try to uh, construct entire uh, length well uh, i cannot uh, complete this talk without uh, thanking my colleagues who are working hard in the field uh, mr sudhir isbud dhananjay marathe and surender thakur desai from nisarga yatri who will be still working in the field with us in order to find more petroglyphs 
and to add more knowledge about existing petroglyphs reported so far. I'm thankful to Dr. Aparna Watpe who did uh, uh, environmental uh, investigations around uh, cave site. Uh, thanks to Mr. Jadish Patil who was then divisional commissioner of Konkan division and who took initiative uh, for protection of this and this process is still not complete. Mr. Uh, Kulkarni was my assistant director when we initiated this. I'm thankful to uh, professors from uh, uh, Deccan College, Sushma Dev, uh, Zogrekar, and Dr. Parth Chauhan and my friend Rutvij Apte for being part of uh, this project. So I thank you all for patient listening and I'll be happy to answer uh, queries if there are any. Oh yes, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor Tejas Garge. There are many questions. <laughs> uh, 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 it's like you put us in a time machine and took us across thirty thousand years. There were a lot of questions connected with the period uh, to which these petroglyphs pertain, uh, but you've answered them by putting a sort of a number to it about thirty thirty thousand years. One question which has been coming up quite often is: Are most of these on flat ground? Or do you find a lot of them on caves and in walls? No petroglyph from Konkan is reported from walls. I think okay. I was not clear enough. All petroglyphs are carved on horizontal ground. Okay. Uh, okay. Of course, uh, some of the petroglyphs in Karnataka and Kerala are carved on the walls or they are carved on vertical boulders. But all petroglyphs from Konkan and Goa are carved on horizontal flat floor. You showed a, an image of one particular petroglyph and there were people working around it. So there was mm -hmm. a question from one uh, viewer. He was asking, can one just walk up and uh, examine these on your own? Or do you have to, are these sites open to the public to visit? That was his question. Uh, sites are quite open to public. Uh, but, you know, I would advise uh, to take uh, a guide uh, either from Nisargayatri or from archaeology department because mm -hmm. finding their locations is quite a tricky business. Okay. In 90% of the cases, you don't have access of road. So road goes somewhere, then you have to walk for about 5 to 6 kilometers in order to approach this petroleum. It, it's always better to take some local perspective. So, Raghu, you know, you need to know now what to do or how to contact uh, this uh, uh, organization that Dr. Garagi spoke about. Right. I'm, uh, I'm going to leave all contact details of uh, Nisajayatri after this talk sure. that can be shared with participants. Great. Um, the technique of going about creating these petroglyphs has drawn a lot of questions. What would be the kind of tools that would be used and were they advanced tools? It's well, Dr. Ashish Kelkar's question. Right. And if you uh, look at typology, I specified two types. One was carving with single lines and another was thick relief carvings. Those thick relief carvings are uh, possible with iron tools. So probably mm -hmm. they are related to Iron Age. But uh, carving with single lines can be done with uh, stones itself. And uh, I mean, uh, 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 when it comes to carving, you have this image of uh, uh, having modern tools and doing carving, but it can be achieved with very simple stones. It is called as punch and hammer technique. So okay. you keep on putting points next to each other just like you draw rangolis by points. Then you connect these points by rubbing with pointed edge of stone. Mm -hmm. so that is how, uh, that's the easiest way to carve this. And we are also planning to do uh, some workshop with JJ School of Arts and some sculpture sculptors uh, so that we can perfectly understand this technique. And uh, some people have also claimed that uh, the high relief sculptures, which we think are carved with iron implements, but they say it is feasible to carve them with uh, hard uh, stone as compared okay. to laterite. 
so uh, in future we'll be doing lot of experimental archaeology to answer all your queries properly so uh, speaking of laterite since you just mentioned laterite ashish kelkar's question was is laterite known as chiriacha dagar locally right right it is chiriacha dagar or zamba uh, as we uh, okay. refer in marathi so okay. going back surface, sorry uh, on surface it is uh, uh, quite a hard stone but uh, once you take a first cut it is quite soft in the interior parts and as it remains more exposed to surface it becomes harder so that's the quality of laterite okay uh, a lot of these you showed the dimensions were really huge so omkar's question was these drawings they which they look so proportionate how do they achieve this kind of proportion uh, the symmetry um like it's always seems like a grid or does does it or was it free hand uh, and the related question was it's probably speculative in nature would some humans have guided the artists from say tree tops to be able to cover <laughs> such a big area if you look at that landscape there are hardly any high trees okay. so it is practically impossible to climb uh, to achieve that height uh, from uh, air uh, but most interesting interpretation has come from uh, a 12 year old boy uh, uh -huh. who is son of uh, a friend of mine he said uh, they must have horizontally laid this elephant and then they carved its outline then they let this elephant go and <laughs> that outline remains and it is i mean such a i mean uh, I, i know practically it is not possible but i think that is how they have visualized it uh, many of these figures are actually life scale figure and some of them are larger than life yes so uh, uh, carving outline uh, must have come with uh, certain visual observation okay wow uh, you mentioned that you were looking for linkages between some of these petroglyphs and the varli art of say northern maharashtra or southern gujarat uh would, would uh, are there any indicators which show up which talk about cross cultural influences between this region and the what we now know as the uh, varli areas right uh one uh, interpretation is cross uh, linkage or uh, some relations between north konkan and south konkan Mm -hmm. the problem is you hardly have any depictions of petroglyphs from north konkan okay. and you hardly have any existence of varli habitat uh, from south konkan mm -hmm. so we need to investigate this more uh, i mean this image from sakha kombe uh, from which we could interpret this varli connection has come to light in recent past so this is okay. quite a new development and archaeological interpretations they took uh, they take their own sweet time to come up with some analogy so i hope in couple of years uh, will be a, uh, in a position to give some better interpretation so staying with cross cultural influences the question from ragu was how is it that some of these depict rhinos and uh, hippos were, were these animals prevalent in this region or was there uh, his question is did these people migrate from the northeast <laughs> well definitely nobody migrated from north east but a very appropriate question we don't see hippopotamus or rhino in context of konkan in modern mm. age yes uh, so to solve this query we invited one archaeozoologist from deccan college professor jobreker and he visited this site and he came up with very interesting observation he said whom so ever has carved this he has actually seen that animal so it is not from somebody's secondary memory mm -hmm. and uh, then we have gone back in time uh, to see uh, when actually i know existed uh, on this part of the country so there are some uh, i know bones from uh, site of uh, lothal uh, which is dating back to uh, and uh, you have evidence from manja valley 
uh, of uh, uh, of uh, bones of hippopotamus so okay. landscape was quite different there was a higher rainfall it was almost uh, a suitable landscape like assam uh, so that provided natural habitat for animals like rhinos and hippos okay uh would some of these sites have been uh, would have any religious significance bharat wants to know definitely uh, i mean uh, whatever points i missed in my talk uh, they are coming up in questions and uh, mm -hmm. thank you for asking this i showed elaborate uh, introduction in form of ajanta paintings pital khora so one has to remember all art depicted in historical context is essentially religious art see my father was an artist and uh, 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 you have to go by uh, uh, commissioner's will uh, and in prehistoric age i don't uh, i can't imagine that i have creativity i can carve this image and you pay me and i'll uh, show my creativity no there has to be some religious reason for this for example uh, if you carve this you will be able to hunt this animal or something like that so it has or there was some smart fellow who sat back and who told other people that i will sit here and pray for you while doing this i will carve this so when you come back from hunting give me my share so that is how uh, one can explain rise of religion uh, from our prehistoric past so definitely oh. they have religious connotations okay um what would be the reason why you believe these petroglyphs have stood the test of time how is it that they have survived i mean nature human intervention how come that did not take its toll on these petroglyphs is the question luckily uh, ask, uh, after uh, exposure of uh, this laterite to surface as i mentioned it becomes harder so there is hardly any natural erosion of uh, rock surface uh, mm -hmm. if you look at uh, uh, this this particular rock but uh, in lately in past 10 20 years after introduction of jcb poklen uh, damage is rapid so i think uh, what we are seeing now is only 30 30% data of what actually existed okay got that uh the observation about uh, the re reproducing woman uh, abe kukreti says that isn't that uh, petroglyph similar to the lajja gauri depiction which is quite common in the deccan true or true. does that have again, a different kind of origin and uh, again uh, one of the points that i missed in my conclusion i uh, built up introductory part so well that i forgot conclusion so all all i think uh, thanks to all listeners who are bringing out this points yes it resembles to the figure of lajja gauri and similar uh, lajja gauri figures uh, they are still worshiped in parts of northern karnataka even in modern context and in historical context lajja gauri image was quite common and it, it it's a goddess of fertility and i think even in prehistoric past uh, fertility uh, is one of the essential factors for continuity of human life so that is being celebrated and uh, being part of the depictions okay so um again staying with the the creation of these petroglyphs has fascinated a lot of people so kaiwan was asking whether all these would be the work of a group of people especially the large complex ones or would it have been a single person i know we are asking you a question which is 30000 years old but <laughs> what what is your finding so definitely i think uh, it was a community effort uh, unless you engage community you can't come up uh, with uh, this kind of art creation of such humongous size uh, so i think i don't think entire community was engaged but a certain group of people who uh, gathered certain expertise in carving 
uh, so a small yeah. group uh, in community i think it was engaged in this carving activity and many people okay. think that they are related to shamanistic practices uh, so this is again small segment of a society uh, which is involved into religion and uh, related uh, things um uh, in brief can one determine the era of, of its creation by looking at a petroglyph i'm sure a expert like you can but can a lay person do that it's a question for from parvez luckily uh, i mean it's it's exactly copy of a natural form of animal so they actually have a power of a direct communication with you uh okay. in uh, in past two years we took many uh, group uh, we did carry out lot of activity uh, related to common people related to schools and uh, I, i mean children they have this amazing eye so they could understand all this pretty easily and uh, i think uh, they have uh, petroglyphs have this uh, capacity to have a direct visual communications with the viewer mm -hmm. so everybody is welcome Okay. Um, this question comes from an artist. Neha Kudsharkar wants to know what is the kind of support, what is the kind of relationship which the locals around these areas have with the petroglyphs? I mean, are they supportive of your efforts, of that NGO's efforts in conserving these, or or is it like like is one of those things? In the initial phase, uh, response was mixed. but now people are very enthusiastic uh, i mean uh, in uh, private people who, who have petroglyphs on their private lands they are actually allowing us to do this conservation activities so uh, there is a great support of locals and without the support it is not possible to do uh, these kind of uh, protection activities so there is a great support from locals now we have uh, kept one number in public domain uh, which is circulated among the locals and people call on it freely amcha gavate asa kai tari ahe so visit our right. village investigate here bring it it on tourism map so there are requests from villagers and now we are not able to cope up with uh, our schedule of visiting those i think this reminds me of a story which bharat is so fond of telling everybody about how when uh, khaki was new and there would be people in the bmc or some a person whom he had met before saying come come tell us a little more about that particular milestone or that particular <laughs> artifact so i think when you involve the people you get more uh, uh, done um and i think anjani's question has been answered about how these have survived for 30000 years you you answer that uh, how can how can a lay person help with this project uh, you said you were going to share the number of the uh, ngo yes i'll be Would sharing you have it handy uh, right now i can send it through whatsapp uh, oh, sure so, uh, I'll, i'll send it across and okay. uh, you can contribute by uh, giving them funds or you can participate uh, in heritage walks whenever they conduct it and uh, we are planning to keep uh, this little expensive so that a portion of money goes towards research and uh, the conservation okay, one last question before we move on to the final comment and uh, it's from bharat what is the marathi what is the local word marathi hindi maybe gujarati for petro is this such a, a word <laughs> so that uh, right now we are calling it as katar shilpa okay. but locals have uh, various names they never refer to it as a, a piece of art but they have their local names for example in devate gotne they call that human figure as ravan okay and uh, they uh, have uh, names like chitrapat and so on so there are different different uh, local variations but uh, for uh, common purpose for now we are calling them as katar shilpa in marathi okay 
Okay. And I'm happy to see Dr. Anita Rani Kothari uh, among the viewers. Uh, she is uh, also among the pioneer, pioneering uh, researchers uh, in finding petroglyphs. So we are just taking her work ahead. Yes. And she has an observation. Uh, I mean, amongst all the people who thanked you and congratulated you, I'm just going to read out verbatim what Dr. Anita Rani Kothari has written. Congratulations, Dr. Tejas, for promoting petroglyphs in the Konkan. Request you to save the Niwali petroglyph, which was cemented partially because of sheer neglect eight month, months ago. And she believes that this petroglyph shows the earliest form of cartography. So that is her request to the archaeological department, I guess. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.